this is uh, an example from Aaron. Um, and one of the nice things about learning progressions is that when it is true, and this is not true in every strand of learning, but in many cases there are typical misconceptions. And you can make sure that you have typical places where you um, ask questions and engage students in tasks that would let you evaluate. This is not a correct answer, um, but it's the pretty typical Lamarckian understanding of um, evolution. And so you want to be sure that you're asking good questions to, to see if students are holding on to that idea or uh, in terms of like, do I ask the same question? It's the case that because this is such a uh, profound uh, misconception, it will disappear if you ask one kind of question, where you kind of scaffold the student to the right answer, and reappear if you ask a slightly different question. So it's important to develop as a, class, as a teacher those challenge questions that help you get at, do they really, in a robust way, understand this, they can explain it to their neighbor, they can, with, they can um, even when it's not transparent that that's what the question's about, bring that knowledge to bear, etc. So we're, we're constantly looking for those things and then we're looking for uh, the ways of exposing it without having students feel that we've trapped them, right? Because the point is to, to learn it, uh, not to take points off on their grades. This is uh, Valerie's question. Um, this is uh, in learning about magnets, also an incorrect model, because uh, I've had people complain lately. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, that I was showing something without saying that it's not right. Um, but this is, this is pretty typical. This, this is a classic misconception when kids get the idea that those something's going on in there. It's some little things, and they organize themselves like this when you first um, ask them to draw a model of a magnetized nail. Um, but as soon, it's so, it's so cute, really, that as soon as you ask that question, so you have to figure out what's going on in their heads, because it's so quick that they know those little guys couldn't run that fast. <laughs> it's, it's, they, you ask that question and you just see the light, just like, ah! Oh, uh, so you wish for every lesson that you had a question, <clears throat> and now this is not an assessment question as much as it is a teaching question. You ask the challenge question that challenges the misconception, and they, and they get it. Now, they don't necessarily immediately draw the right model, but they abandon this one, and they can even tell you why it's wrong. Uh, and so then they have to do the harder work now, figuring out how would those new guys inside that nail organize themselves to now have polarity with the two pieces. But they don't have to actually do the experiment to, to know it. They, uh, and that's why it's such a great example of to, to see them um, be with you in the reasoning. Um, and this is, I think, my last example. This is one of where they worked harder at getting the experts' knowledge about a progression aligned with and tested <coughs> um, uh, em empirically so that um, they can show how much harder density is to get than either uh, mass or volume. And why then we have to put a lot of our development efforts into <coughs> what kinds of things, like we don't have as many actually, or as uh, for sure effective questions uh, like the nail example around that problem of density. Because that's a, that's a very uh, persistent Difficulty. I won't say it's a misconception, although they'll, they'll answer a lot of questions inaccurately um, if, you're, if you're assessing right at that level. But that's where a lot of the instructional effort has to go. So, um, you haven't interrupted a lot. 
enough. Uh, no. So this is, I was just going to switch to this last stuff, which isn't so much about assessment, but it's about um, sort of classroom <coughs> norms that go with these ideas around assessment. And um, I'm worried that I've taken too long. Um, well, it is a very, very nicely done 15 minute talk. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only grabbed. extracted from how people learn by the learning and understanding uh, authors. So it's, it's a subsequent NRC distillation that gives you very nice, um, here are some distilled learning principles, and then in parallel, here are some uh, distilled uh, principles for curriculum and instruction. Um, so middle point there, students are engaged in worthwhile tasks. But I'd also like to say, and we've, we've been touching a little bit on it, that you want your classroom processes around those tasks to be uh, like the practices in the science. Um, you want interactions to focus on detecting, making visible, and addressing students' fragile understandings and misconceptions. And you want to just establish those as norms in the classroom. So um, I think this, I'd like to end with these last couple of slides that are about, <coughs> well, how do you do that? How do you change the norms? Because typically, top bullet, the norms in classrooms are uh, to pretend to know. And we really have to work hard at getting students to take risks, uh, to admit when they don't know, and make it normative in our classrooms for that to be the purpose of the interaction for that to be the purposes of the questions that they ask you instead of showing off, uh, for that to be a, a, something where it's safe uh, for you to ask challenging questions and, and students not feel attacked, um, and that that's a genuine learning opportunity. Um, Ignore that. Yeah. So, uh, here are a couple of uh, things that Heller and colleagues again have done uh, to try to actually focus <coughs> strategies on getting good at these conceptual problems. Um, they go so far as to assign roles. Um, and this is back to our just our ideas about um, developing reasoning and developing intelligence. I thought a good illustration of last night was wasn't able to uh, find a good example. Um, in most K-12 schools now, you'll see in the gym, and sometimes near the office, some rules uh, for how we're gonna argue. If we're having a fight, um, here are some shared norms in our school for how each person has to say what happened, how it made them feel, and how they're gonna resolve the problem. And the fact that the whole school shares those norms means the kids uh, don't stop fighting, uh, but actually uh, there is some research that uh, suggests that we have um, less conflict if we teach students how to negotiate. Um, and for sure, kids who have not had that uh, practice um, can develop some skills um, to get better at it. So it is, it is sort of helping everybody get better, and the fact that it's shared is useful. So here, we're actually telling, teaching people in a classroom how to get good at participating in doing science. Um, and this, i uh, pretty sure since you've got this room that looks just like this, uh, you know the scale of research. But that'd be another example um, of learning research brought to bear on the interactions uh, that go with those conceptual <coughs> Thank you.
time for more questions? Or I've got bounce? plenty of time. I'm just uh, <coughs> embarrassed that I took more than I'll hold off. I've already asked a few. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> Uh, you have to hold off a whole wait, minute. Wait you, have to, you have to hold off a whole minute. Yeah, okay. Somebody from engineering. Well, I'm interested in the instructional design experiments. Does that mean people are actually trying out different learning progressions and mm -hmm. finding out which works better at, at the college level? <clears throat> um, that sinking and floating example, um, I thought was high school rather than college, but I think there are some um, geneticists that are trying them out at a college level. Um, and they don't say, you know, here's one whole different learning progression, here's another. They do the design experiments around the part that's the most uncertain, where they, where they, where they have classroom experience, uh, because the, the idea is ultimately have a teaching sequence that goes with the learning sequence, sure. right? So yeah. what you, what you want are lots of those cut the nail in half problems mm -hmm. that are that are um, just the bag of tricks that you want to go with this learning um, goal that you've set that you don't want to have to invent from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is really this is really a commitment to curriculum development. Uh, but again, we do not have a strong tradition of in this country. We expect everybody um, to figure it out for themselves. Yeah. How much of, you know, I guess I'm just always struggling with the learning progressions a little bit. I haven't read that much about it, so I'm somewhat ignorant on it as well. But um, just the idea that, you know, that, there, that there's one <coughs> progression that students would follow doesn't completely resonate with me. <laughs> like, you know, I see students working with the simulation, for instance, and they go all different pathways right. to try to understand something. Right. Um, so, so I'm just wondering, you know, how much evidence is there that the, that learning progressions are really um, the same for the majority of students? Oh, <clears throat> well, yeah, this is why I'm worried that people are so <clears throat> enamored, because, um, there probably are things that are perfectly sequenced, but and then there are probably things that are completely disordered and everything in between. I can, I can imagine large steps are sequenced, but there's no um, Well, I think the problem is, is that getting the brain size right is so different topic by topic, right? So, um, I think you have, if you want to use this as a tool, I think you have to have a very flexible understanding about what it means. So, um, and, and imagine a K-12 teacher, for example, who's teaching very different subjects side by side. Um, I think there's a profound difference between a skill like reading and writing and getting good in, um, content-rich subjects like history and biology. Now, there are also some things, though, about uh, scientific inquiry that might have a longer arc of development. So, but notice, if I wanted to map scientific inquiry it turns out when people have tried to do this crudely, the tasks that they assign are highly dependent on the knowledge of the content that's being brought to bear in the formulated hypotheses, in the examination of evidence, you know, so you can't get an inquiry measure that's content free. So even if we say, well, we've got these big arcs and then we've got these little strands because some of those strands, the magnetism strand is intriguing. That is a help, right? But it's just this little segment of learning. Um, and there are lots of other things, even in a course on magnetism, that aren't going to conform to this, this before that. 
So I think you, you have to just be alert to where are these sequences? Where are their misconceptions? Where it's, it's really important to learn about that and also to learn about the teaching tricks to deal with it. Um, but I don't imagine that you could finally come up with a map of a scientific discipline where you had, you know, all of these things ordered. And because I think you, for everything that's like the magnetism example, I think you could think of another example where going past to some context of application helped you learn something that came before. And so it, it would just be terrible if people got religious about this and said, you know, we have to learn this before we learn that. That's, that would be a huge mistake. So this is intriguing. It's interesting. You can imagine how representing it to kids would help move forward. And I do think even at the university level, you're going to have some things where you say, aha, it's useful to know. Yeah, I just saw it at, like, when yeah. I went to the DRK 12 meeting. It was just everywhere. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, learning progression, yeah, learning progression. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, I it's like, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> so I share your dismay. And just then a good question for us, like, in a year or after you work, is, what are some good ways of even sorting through that literature? You know, because it certainly can't conform to one way of thinking. Right. I mean, yeah. Yes. Just a partial response to Kathy. I, what I find them powerful for is in talking with teachers, I, I think two ways. One is diagnosing what foundational concepts might be causing trouble. Right. You know, if we're doing the rock cycle, what back before the rock cycle might be um, where the kid is having trouble. And then I also think for teachers to have a sense of, I'm teaching you know, the rock cycle, but someone next year or the year after needs the students to know, you know to have a sense of, of movement through right. school, so that it's not just, I do rocks and then I'm done, um, but that yeah. someone else is gonna go forward to play tectonics and needs the students to really understand you know, how the rock cycle um, tells us about and gives us you know, evidence that we can use right. to figure out plate tectonics. So I find that a powerful thing to help teachers see your piece is critical and you need to know something about the kinds of things that might come before and the kinds of things that come after, right. even if every kid doesn't hit it that way. Right. So that, like, so that's where I think this But those are learning like, sequences that we have had. And well, but they've always sometimes been arbitrary, them. right? And not right. developmentally appropriate. I mean, California does a periodic table yes. in grade three. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so good. So the idea of, of some empirical investigation along with the expert, um, where you actually test out whether yeah. it works and whether relying on this and this should come before that is, is that's, that's an improvement. I mean, obviously, it, students have to, like, kids have to know what the numbers mean before I can learn how to add. Yes. Yeah. And so, and it's interesting that some of the uh, you know, firmest examples are at the very early grades. Um, and it's where human development is also the most profound, right? Um, so that's, it's, it's why developmental psychology has so focused on the early grades. But, yeah. I have one example surprised me was at the university freshman level, but I, I share Kathy's concern that we know that students think and develop in different ways, but it, but it is valuable to me to look at a progression because sometimes when I look at the things that are supposed to be the basis of somewhat further knowledge, I go, gosh, I wonder who taught them the basis. So let me give you my example. We always talk about star colors and colors of things in astronomy. And one day it occurred to me to ask my students if they knew the filter did. When you look through a red filter. And year after year, a third of my students say, oh yes, it changes everything to red. And a third of my students say, let's red through. And the rest sort of say, let's blue through. And, and so, because... The blue people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the because red so people are superficial. Somebody else has done some research about a progression in a learning that in, and so I guess the way I look at it is, well, okay, maybe one third of my students are fine, 
and, and, but the other two are following some trajectory that doesn't have a basis. So that I, I just found that useful. There's got to be a lot of this out there. Yeah. So, so what <coughs> I hear is doing is bridging from research on prior knowledge, which is abundant, and that's where you just kind of go back and look at prerequisite knowledge or related experiences that can be drawn in as a resource, but that no one ever tried to sequence. So, if, you know, what we're saying here is that a purposeful uh, attention to prior knowledge that's likely to have occurred or that's likely to be an impediment is now getting organized more formally into these sequences or, uh, or progressions. Yes? Uh, I, I don't know, I just, I, I'm a, I don't understand how it would even be possible to begin to say that you've that, that it's ever been tracked like learning progressions from say one course to the next. I mean like when uh, it's not clear whether a student has used procedural knowledge, memorization, or conceptual knowledge to answer any one specific question on any one test, when that hasn't been tracked there, you know, and then the richness of that information has disappeared into a grade somewhere before it goes on to the next class and then they ask or asked a similar question like it, it seems to be that there's just no way to, to really track it or to really use it unless there's a better communication and, and capturing structure. I don't know. Any thoughts? I mean, can, can we really do anything with this with just grades? Oh, well, you mean with just, yeah, the way that we give grades has almost no relationship to <coughs> this way of thinking about assessing and teaching. I agree. So it comes to have a purpose inside a grade level as opposed to get, though um, Sandra's already given an example of how grade to grade it could it could be useful. It could be useful. But for sure we're not um, we're not passing on a cumulative record that says so and so has already mastered this. We very likely will use our um, opening of a of a unit of study by testing for prerequisite knowledge, asking students to uh, do some warm-up exercises that draw on what we hope is knowledge they already have but maybe need to be reminded about or asked to think about. So um, while this could span grades and does in other countries where it's more organized, uh, we're more likely to use this as a tool uh, presently within grade or even within a course. And do they focus on, like within a grade or within a course, on separating out learning, uh, learning progressions based on whether or not there's a progression of conceptual understanding or a progression of learning procedures and little steps of procedures? Um, when I think, I haven't thought of answering that question before, but when I look at some of the examples, they tend to be conceptual examples. But sometimes they will uh, go from uh, computation to application. Uh, so sometimes within a narrower strand, hmm. people will try to say, well, this is the, you, you have to be able to do the, these procedures in the sure. service of some larger conceptual problem. The um, soccer field example certainly has steps in it where you want them to be able to apply the algorithms but it's embedded in a conceptual problem. And the progressions are increasingly difficult conceptual problems. But I mean, like we've seen students who were able to do come, uh, go through the AP physics course and get all of these supposedly great conceptual problems right. And right. like Missouri said, nope, they didn't know any of that. So I mean, it, it, I find it a little hard to just believe that the learning progressions have been tracked very clearly. I'm sorry, yeah. I, I should stop talking now. I'm going to go back to man in the camera. <laughs> well, it occurs to me it might be an issue not that they didn't know it to begin with, but that they don't know it anymore. And so that brought me to thinking about portfolios, because we use portfolios sometimes to demonstrate what students are supposed to know. Right. But how, how, how long are portfolios considered to be good for before it kind of tails off? <laughs> what's their, what's their well, age you know, day? Right. So, so, bo so both of you are saying something really um, you know, back to the fundamental question, like the first question. <laughs> because it's true that, like, I, I always try, when I'm trying to struggle with this kind of thinking, uh, think of, well, what does an expert look like? Why would I consider this person who doesn't remember blank 
still to be expert. And it's not embarrassing that they don't know that. So, in fact, uh, when you're asking questions on comps, it would always be a good idea to say, don't ask questions on comps, where if you asked your colleagues, they would be embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so we do allow for a certain amount of forgetting, but we're, we, we, we are working very hard here. This whole point is against uh, sort of unforgivable forgetting. So what in our model of learning and expert mastery of a domain um, can be forgotten and, and what not? What, how do you, because you always want returning to first principles to be what the expert can do. Especially when they, they, don't, they, they aren't even sure what the nature of this problem is. So that's what I think we're really trying to do each time we invent a portfolio or we invent an AP exam. And whenever you can point to examples where it's, it decays, it's not true anymore, or they pass this exam and they aren't good in, in freshmen, we have failed. So. What we're constructing here is the ultimate test of what it would look like to make a good assessment that we could rely on as having this sort of generalizable, believable, yes, lose a little bit like experts always do, but have first principles. A good thing to have them do is teach to somebody else. You know, that's a good assessment task because then you're pretty sure um, and that's why that they that they actually have some command over it. Um, one of the features of this kind of knowledge that's not vulnerable to forgetting and, um, and and having it decay is that it's quite flexible. Um, it doesn't again in the teaching the test literature you don't have to come at it this one way. But if the kind of scientists talk about flexibility and they're, they're using very different examples than my teaching the test examples. It really means that context doesn't matter in coming to understand the nature of what's at stake. It's a very principled s schema that the expert has um, that allows them to teach it, that allows them to come into a strange context and still uh, make sense of it, etc. So. That's what, that's what we're aiming for in how we build the portfolio. And if it disappoints you, then I would revise with that uh, complaint in mind. How do I make it less vulnerable to that kind of um, disappointment? But, but I'm, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, when I think about a real expert, they can actually reconstruct how the system should work, right, in a certain way. They don't actually have to remember anything in a, in a sort of weird way. Yeah. They sort of get the logic of it. Right. And, but there, and but we there don't give people that practice people, yeah. in that. Right. So that's what we don't do, right? How we would you never, we, that? Well, you just ask somebody to explain how something must work. Right, because if you know it, you you know you don't have to remember. So that that AP question that was in the New York Times, you know, why does sodium not go through? Oh, because it's hydrophilic. Well, that doesn't tell you anything, right? So I can tell you know. So if you really understand why it doesn't go through a membrane, you know that you know all the things that are going on in that system, right. and you can actually reconstruct the reason it doesn't go without having to remember it. Right. Right. So to me, what an expert does that's different is they. They don't have to remember it, right? You don't have to remember the names of everything. You can say, well, it must, I understand how the system works. It must be this way. So that, um, I agree. And just and we a, don't let people a, little, a little side note is a lot of times people say that they're asking a conceptual question, and it is a vocabulary question. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, and, and they don't mean it, but if, as upon scrutiny, it really is just a vocabulary question. Uh, then you have to say, well, how could I get at this concept? And Mike's just given us a, a, a way of, you know, actually give them some, a different mechanism entirely. Maybe even a fabricated one, like these fabricated uh, uh, creatures, um, and ask them to make it work the same way as this thing that they have a memorized definition about. Um, if Getting the the key to the working is what we're really after. 
I guess the only thing, so I thought, the thing about what Kathy was saying, it's like the idea is that there's one pathway through doesn't seem correct, because I don't think everybody goes the same pathway. But also the idea that it's linear, that it's a continuous pathway also. At some point, you're going to put together a bunch of things and right. say, oh, I got it. Right. right. But it's not as if you can, you can force people to make the jump. You can encourage them that when they fall, it won't hurt so much. But, you know, they still have to jump in. Right? Because a lot of those ideas are really weird and hard to get, right? So. Yeah. They're, they're not just assembled. Um, you know, very uh, old theories of learning were uh, layers of bricks and uh, bit by bit, and kind of an accretion model of getting to understand things. And we just know that that's, and, and by the way, you should reinforce each step, and that's how uh, people would get Well, it's a nonlinear model. Right? It's, it's like all of a sudden you go yours from... Is, yours is, uh, or how we think it actually works, um, is, is definitely not bit by bit. And another danger with learning professions is we don't want people to think that it's just uh, that kind of reinforcement. So it's uh, 4.23 according to Ed's computer. So the, the next 15 minute talk will be scheduled uh, <laughs> in the future. That's great. Thanks, Laurie. Thank you.